Uh, we are thrilled to have you here today. I am thrilled to have you here today. Thank you. Um, Heidi, your story of a 15-year-old girl in love with the Constitution and the journey that we go on as we understand how the Constitution does and does not define the lives that we lead um, is really deeply affecting. The experience from the audience and the performance I saw was one where the whole audience, you could really feel we felt as one listening to you, going on this journey with you. And I think that that's in large part because of the warmth and candor that you bring to the production. And I wanted to start kind of at the beginning. So I understand that you wrote this for um, a theater company, the Club Thumb Theater yes. Company. Yep. And this was a few years ago. And I was wondering if you could just tell mm. us a little bit about the journey the piece has taken from when you first started it with them to today. Sure. Uh, I actually started the play about 10 years ago. Uh, well, 20 years ago, I actually had the idea to write a play about the Constitution where I would trace a personal, I would take a personal story and connect it to every single amendment in the Constitution, but that was m way too ambitious and I quit. Uh, <laughs> and then 10 years later, I thought I should go back to that idea. Um, doing this contest as a teenager was such a formative part of my growing up. It was such an interesting time. I wanted to return to that and I thought, uh, what if I take one amendment <laughs> and, and try to try to do that, try to find the way this one amendment has shaped my life, affected my life. And then, of course, that led me to the way it's shaped um, the lives of the, the women in my family is what I focused on. Um, so, I, yeah, I really started with a very kind of innocent idea just to revisit this time and and try to find a personal personal stories that connected to the Constitution. And then it kind of led me into this deep dive into the, the legal history of women in this country, which I actually wasn't expecting. Interesting. Um, have you found over time that the audience has changed in their reaction to it or in what you feel from the audience? Uh, I mean, I can ask my team too, but I feel like... Uh, it changes every night. I mean, the, the, the play has largely, I, I first performed my section, which is a, like an almost an hour long monologue uh, while Obama was president. Um, and it was received very well at that time too. But I think now, uh, it, although it remains unchanged, depending on what's going on in the world and the news that day, suddenly parts of it suddenly seem incredibly vital and urgent to to the moment. So people respond differently every single night, depending on what's going on in the world. Okay. Yeah. So I just want to take a quick moment to introduce everyone in our cast. So here we have Heidi Schreck, who is the playwright and the star of the show. We have Thursday Williams, Rose Deli Cyprian, uh -huh. and Mike Iveson as well. <laughs> My next, my next question is for Rostily and Thursday. So in the play, you alternate performances and you are in real life very experienced debaters and you're also on stage debating with Heidi. Um, in kind of drawing from your experience being in this play as well as accomplished debaters in your own right, what do you think debating can teach us, teach people? Um, can I? Oh, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that debate can teach you that there's two sides to every story and each side has its flaws and its imbalances, but then there's also something that's very similar about it. So it teaches you how to go against your like natural beliefs, but still put it in a way where you still actually want to do it. So it's like it changes your perspective for a minute. That's what I learned from debate. <laughs> um... That is a very interesting question. Uh, <laughs> wait, can you ask the question again? Well, <laughs> sure. Um, I'm just wondering if, based on your experiences doing the play where you're debating Heidi, as well as your experiences debating through debate clubs and the other opportunities you've had, what do you think debating can bring to people who aren't in a debate? 
Um, I'm just going to piggyback uh, off of what Roselli said. Um, I feel like um, during a debate, it's it's very essential that a person hears both sides of, um, of uh, an issue. And I think this is a very difficult question. Um, <laughs> That's great. Thursday is uh, her like inner compass for truth is very strong. So, you know, we switch sides every night in this debate about the Constitution and she will not say a thing unless she believes it. So it's it. I mean, that is. I, I agree with both of you. Like, that's one of the most challenging things about a debate is really to try to get into the mindset and perspective of a point you might totally disagree with and to find what parts of that argument might ring true to you. And you are a very, you have to go through a deep process to, um, <laughs> yeah. to do that. And then you come out with some amazing truth that, that usually um, flummoxes me. <laughs> So I learned that you've had a number of luminaries come and see the show over the course of its run, and they've included some Supreme Court justices. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, and this question is for, for anybody on the panel is, um, what, what has the experience been like performing or meeting these people such as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, et cetera? And do you have any particular stories or experiences you would highlight? <laughs> Um, uh, the, the RBG <laughs> night was a very big night. It was a roller coaster of a night yeah. <laughs> yeah. for all of us, I think. Uh, some of us knew she was out there while performing because some people made a mistake and accidentally told us. And uh, That's only, some of us... only Heidi knew. <laughs> None of us knew. Yeah. Heidi was the only one. I Heidi knew. <laughs> yeah, but you figured it out pretty quickly, right? I figured it out because I say in my opening <laughs> monologue, I say, uh, well, it's good, um, this is a good chance to give these kids a chance to see what it's like when they're arguing in front of the Supreme Court one day. And ordinarily, the audience is like, oh, okay. <laughs> and on this day, they're like, whoa, oh, my God, whoa. I was like, what? What? <laughs> what? I was like, what? <laughs> and then I kind of looked at Heidi, and she was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, and then I still had myself tricked. I was still like, that could be Elena Kagan. <laughs> Which probably would not still RBG. be amazing. Yeah. Let's be clear. That it's would be amazing. Probably not Alito. <laughs> probably not Justice Thomas. But maybe it's Kagan. That was, that was just foolish. Like, yeah. that's, that's the person. That's the, the rock star of the Supreme Court. So of course, the whole audience flipped out. It was, it was amazing. But then Thursday was debating that night. And Thursday, I mean, we're all RBG de- devotees. But um, yeah. she is the biggest of all. She argues with an RBG pencil. Is it okay if I disclose yeah. this? Yeah. <laughs> she has more legal training than all of us. Let me be clear. So go um, ahead. <laughs> so RBG came, but Sonia Sotomayor came um, as well. Had come uh, earlier. She had yeah. come like about a week or two earlier. And yeah. she tricked us. She told us that RBG will not be coming um, anytime soon, but apparently they've been having secret conversations about <laughs> Yeah. Which is fine. And we but, were all um, like, oh, okay. <laughs> Dr. Mayor says she's not coming till August. <laughs> um, but my experience, when I, you know, I met um, Sonia Sotomayor, I did her internship program over the summer, and I met her for five seconds by the elevator, and I told her the story of my name. And as soon as I finished the story, the Secret Service just grabbed away from me, and I, I yelled out, I will see you soon. <laughs> I don't know how or when I was going to see her, but I made it happen because now I've had, like, more than 20 minutes with her telling me she loves me and, and yeah. like, I have oh my God, VIP sorry. pass to the Supreme Court. Um, sorry, Mike. She also, she made it very clear that she came to see Thursday. Yeah. It was very exciting. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and RBG, I, uh, I collapsed to the floor. <laughs> that's my um, Oh, wait a minute. Let's not, let's not jump ahead thing. because, just, because a lot of stuff I happened collapsed. before. Hey, Mike. <laughs> the young women, so the young women are backstage. Heidi and I are on stage all the time. The young women are backstage the whole time. Right. So keeping it for me is not that big a deal. I just was like, I wander around in a haze all the time anyway. I figured it out on stage. Heidi figured it out right before we went on stage. But the real trick was keeping it from these two women yeah. <laughs> as they're waiting backstage for what is it, like an hour and a half? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. They stole my phone. <laughs> they didn't. Stage management stole her phone. Yeah. And so then also they could see 
they could tell me if I get this right, Terry, but like so they could see Secret Service standing in the back of the house. I saw yeah. the Secret Service. Terry was like, <laughs> Terry was like, no, somebody went to the restroom and is standing at the back of the theater. I'm like, okay. <laughs> because I wasn't on that that day, and I'm just like, wait, what's going on? I, everybody's running around the building. This isn't what usually happens. And then my guardian, Kate, she was just like, I, I, I don't want you to scream because this is a workplace. We're not going to scream. <laughs> so she just dragged me into my dressing room. She was like, somebody very important is here. And I was just like, who is it? Who is it? Is it, is it Liza Koshy? Is it somebody that I adore? And then she was just like, no, it's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I'm just like, do not scream. This is where he works. Do not scream. Do not scream. So like, I squeezed her hand. I think I collapsed on my little couch futon thing. And I was just like, who? Does Thursday know yet? They were just like, I don't know. I think they're telling her now. And I'm just like, oh my they God. Did not tell me. But also Thursday waits backstage. Right it's a before, unicorn no, 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 I'm talking about when you're on stage. So right before she comes on stage, we actually play a Ruth Bader Ginsburg yes. snippet, <laughs> a, an audio snippet of Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg right before she comes on stage. So apparently Thursday was backstage. They heard the snippet. The audience flipped out. All they all stood on their feet. They all turned around and looked at RBG. Yeah. <laughs> It's very, but Thursday couldn't see, no. right? But because you could hear Terry, it. Terry kept me standing forward. You need to stay in place. What? <laughs> Terry. I paced back and forth before every show. Why do I need to stay in place? They did very well. Terry's um, our ASM. <laughs> It was good. It was so good. They they kept it from it me. Was... I think they told. Didn't they tell you that the audience was so uh, vocal and cheering because they drink a lot in the summers or something? <laughs> <laughs> what? There yeah. was some no. like excuse about Terry, why the audience was so Terry, vocal. Terry told me that they, there's like many ends to the play, and um, like she said that the people thought that that's like the end of the play uh, when yes. it's like okay, I would default. But they've never done that any other yeah. night. Yeah. <laughs> So, and we're like 100 shows in. Was, That's okay. Oh, and not to be kind of stalkerish, we have a life-size photo of her in our Unicorn Lounge. That's true. <laughs> Backstage, we have, a, we have a cardboard cutout of RBG. And I think she has like three heads. <laughs> so, don't worry, they're detachable. <laughs> uh, so then we all sort of collapsed. When, when, she, when she was backstage, we all sort of collapsed. Thursday did not Thursday did not stop crying for a second, and I was just like, I I know, <laughs> I can't believe we're I know. It was just like was Sonia. Very Sonia, um, one thing that I really just my last story. <laughs> Please, um, I love so, RBG is from Brooklyn. Sonia Sotomayor is from the Bronx, and I'm going to be from Queens, right? So it's like, we got three bars that's going in the Supreme Court. <laughs> um, but but um, when, when because this is, I, I, I love RBG. I, like, I'm trying to keep it together. I love RBG. Um, but I love, I love Sotomayor more. Like, I love them both equally. <laughs> um, but... I, I was really, um, what made me like really, um, my dream school was Cornell for undergrad. And I applied to many schools. I didn't get into Cornell, their loss. Um, <laughs> I was following RBG's path because, you know, she went to Cornell. Uh, but Sonia Sotomayor looked at me and she goes, I'm very proud of you for getting into Trinity College. My niece applied. She didn't get in and she cried. So you're doing something great. And <laughs> I was like, bye, Cornell. Yeah, the Ginsburg with three heads threw me a little bit. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, Mike, I had a question for you because mm. you're, the, you're the only man in the show mm -hmm. and you're on the stage the whole time mm -hmm. and um, you, ha you have more than one role, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And... You are sitting there, not just listening, but you're an active listener. It's very apparent to me, sitting in the audience, that you weren't sitting and just sitting, <laughs> but that you were really involved in what Heidi was saying yeah. and in hearing her and having a conversation back. It's a little bit like a Greek chorus yes, of one. I like that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I wondered how you have seen the, the, the production of the show change, how your experience has changed, and as a follow-on, what the experience of working on your piece was like with Heidi. You mean my, my little monologue that I say toward the end of the, the show? Well, to answer your first question, um, 
I, I really like what I get to do in the show because it is quite open what I'm doing. There's a lot of ways that because I'm, 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 I'm not, I'm perfectly visible. I'm not hidden. And what I'm actively doing is listening in a way I'm sort of, um, was it the person that the audience sort of identifies with in a mm-hmm. certain way? I mean, of course they identify with Heidi, but then sometimes they're like, I would expect that they're like, was who am I that weirdo on the side? Who's listening <laughs> to her? Do you know what I mean? Um, but then it, it's also, I get to be sort of an antagonist. I get to be sort of the person that, that, that is sort of a vaguely a counter argument or point of view from what Heidi's saying. But then Heidi just uses me as a prop for like basically all of her stuff. I'm basically <laughs> every man in every one of her stories. <laughs> sometimes I'm her dad. Sometimes I'm her teacher, Mr. Berger. Which I don't, just to be clear, if you haven't seen, I don't say anything. <laughs> it's not like I like put on a hat. I'm like, I'm Mr. Berger now. You know what I mean? I just, um, so um, she talks a lot about men. I think it's very, I think it's really smart on Heidi's part that she talks a lot about women and about men. Um, but then there's a, it's a, it complicates your processing it to see a guy sitting there for some reason. It just makes it slightly complicated. And also, of course, what I'm doing is I'm, I am actively listening. So like, that's like, I'm sort of telling the audience that's what you might want to be doing right now too. Like really pay attention because actually you don't want to miss it, Heidi's, what Heidi's doing is very deceptive. It seems like, oh, I know what the genre is. It's like one woman show talking about her experiences. But it's like, a, I think it's a lot more than that. And like, if the audience follows me and really tuning in, they'll, they'll catch all the other stuff that's going on. Also, I think that the show is a play. Like, it's not a one woman show. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I, I, we get the experience quite frequently that people see once and the content is very overwhelming. There's a lot of very intense stuff that that mostly Heidi talks about. And then the second time, I hear this from people all the time, you spend a lot of time trying to negotiate the relationship between me and Heidi on stage. You know what the content is going to be, and then you realize how complicated it is what's going on between me and Heidi the whole time. Um, The second question is, I have a monologue at the end of the show where I talk about my own experiences, not dissimilar to the way that Heidi does, and... Yeah, I just, I had to, yeah, Heidi asked me a bunch of questions, and it's just, the stuff that was worth talking about was the stuff that was the hardest stuff to talk about. I mean, I don't know that that's always true. I don't know that that's a truism for, like, every play or every piece of art or anything, but for this show, it really, it was stuff, it was was a bunch of stuff I'd never told anybody, and you don't even realize you haven't told, that's that kind of stuff. And so I just told a bunch of way too many stories and we like whittled it down into something and Heidi made it sound like actual good English. <laughs> because that's what she's been gifted at. You were speaking good English before. I mean... But... <laughs> it I... was interesting though. They were stories. I don't think I realized uh, how important that was for this character. Obviously mine too. To uh, there, There is an element of the play that is like bringing to light the things that um, are normally I think we are too ashamed to talk about in this culture or we just are too polite to talk about or we think we're not supposed to share or, you know, all the, all the layers of taboo. And so it is important, I think, to find the kernels of the things that you're willing to, um, to share for the first time with the, to, speaking to the larger idea that the only way to move toward a more humane, just culture is to uh, be honest about what it's really like for us to live in this country. So... Did you find when working on the material for yourself that, you know, Mike's talking about telling a story that he hasn't told anybody. When you were working on it because it's your piece, did you find that you were telling yourself things you didn't know? I certainly discovered all kinds of things I didn't know. I mean, I, I learn something new every night doing the play, both, both just by the act of... Um, saying things out loud and, and, and even having the debate, like I learned from Rosedelli and Thursday, like in debating, I am like, wait a second, they, they just beat me on that point. I think I have a better idea. I feel like the show is constantly evolving in that way that we're always learning things. Um, but uh, the biggest uh, thing for me, the biggest thing I learned was that I was actually very scared to talk about things that I thought I was quite open about. Like I grew up 
My mom is a survivor of physical and sexual violence. She was very open about it from the time I was a little girl. She's told me the story. She supported other survivors publicly. And this was back in the 80s. She was really on the forefront of being open about that stuff. So when I started to talk about those kinds of things in my show, I thought, well, I grew up knowing that it's important to talk about this and, there sh and we shouldn't be ashamed of it. And it's also not our fault if that happens to us. And yet I still was overcome. Like the first time I tried to speak it out loud on stage, my heart started beating. I yeah. wanted to throw up. I wanted, I did in fact walk off stage and had to be convinced to come back out. I drank some tequila after I was just like, um, I, I could feel in my body actually like centuries of taboo, even though I thought I was very open and and okay talking about this stuff. That is the biggest thing I learned. Yeah. I, I found it, watching you that it felt like a very brave act. And I thought about how you do this eight times a week. Yes. And how that's probably freeing in a certain way, but also it's a lot of emotional work and physical work to, to do this over and over again. And I wondered if throughout the production, if things have, have you made concrete changes to the script along the way to reflect either how it's changed, the experience has changed for you inside or to reflect changing political situations, news cycle? Um, I have not made any giant changes. Like things change, little things change, our debate changes in little ways. Um, but the content is largely the same, mainly because it, it has been the same in some ways for 230 years. Like the thing I'm, the things I'm talking about are systems that have been in place, well, for centuries, but also in this country for 230 years. So, um, that doesn't change a lot. What, what really changed, but my relationship to things changes. Like some, I, many things are easier to talk about now than they were. Sometimes they're harder. Like I found the whole, this actually, I found this week performing the show to be very exhausting because of the Jeffrey Epstein story, I actually, I'm just bringing so much more rage in, and grief into the theater with me that I, I find that a little harder. Um, but in many ways, it's been very healing in my life. Like my relationship with my mom is at a whole new, beautiful place because we've been really even more honest with each other than, than we were when I was growing up. Um, that part has been very healing. And then hearing other people's stories, people stay at the stage door and share their own stories with me. And I find a lot of actually comfort. Not, I mean, I, it makes me sad that the stories are so common, but I know that because of the statistics. So I actually find comfort in the sense of community and sharing and openness. Okay. Uh, Rose Deli and Thursday. So for both of you, this is your first time on a professional stage in a play, right? And I'm wondering what's different or the same about debating Heidi in front of an audience versus a debate that you might do through school? Ooh. Um, it's different because, you know, there's like 580 people watching now. <laughs> <laughs> and, but in the sense, it's like more comfortable with Heidi because like, She's like this, like this ball of light. I call her sunny, sunny sunshine sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like more comfortable. And it's like sometimes like Heidi's like, sometimes she like switches things up and I'm just like, oh my God. And then sometimes I have to switch things up. So in that way, it's kind of like hard. But then when I do, when I used to do it in like school wise, it would kind of be the same, but it would only be the same when we did state and city championships because that school was watching. Then the judges were watching. There were like three judges and like 20 kids crammed into a classroom. And I honestly think that that's more intense <laughs> than what I do in the show because it's like you find I find comfort when I'm doing the show. Now that I've gotten used to it so much and the fact that Heidi shares these deeply personal stories, I'm just like, Rosella, you gotta, you gotta chill out. Like you see what she's doing over here and you're freaking out over a debate. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it's different. Just like the feeling, but it's way more intense when you do it at school. And when you have a debate coach yelling at you. <laughs> <laughs> There's no yelling in our... <laughs> <laughs> Except for our part. Well, we yell, but yes, yeah. we yell during the debate. But yeah. Um, <laughs> for me, it's it's the same. I debating is something I hold right here. Like I just just 
it just, I just, before every show, I'm backstage with this, my stage manager, Terry, and I'm pacing back and forth. <laughs> like, oh my God, I'm so nervous. I'm like, it's just, it's really, it's the same feeling that I have before a real debate. The only thing is it's more, it's funny. In, in my real debates, I'm not laughing at yeah. all. I have to, the trophy is my goal. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no, there's no laughing there. Um, but it's, it's pretty much the same. I go out with the same energy, with the same um, mindset. It's to win. Um, she really <laughs> yeah. um, And I'm nervous just the same way. Probably nervous even more for the show because it's a, it's a lot of people. So... I'm the same. I will say one of the greatest pleasures for me is, you know, when I, we first had this idea to have, I mean, it just seemed like a beautiful idea to, since I did this debate as a teenager to have a teenager now be part of the show. And I was like, I didn't want this sense that if I was debating a teenager, that there was anything cute about it or that like I would be trying to let them win, which, wow, it's funny that I ever thought that. I would have to do that. Um, so, so debating these young women is like really because like I just fighting as hard as I can to actually win. And I get to be as ferocious as I can possibly be because they m match and usually exceed me on every point. So it's really exciting to get to like, yeah. to match wits with these women because they're so brilliant. Um, so that, that has been really pleasurable for me. And I feel like I've gotten better as a debater. So, yeah. You can really get like your rage out there. <laughs> and it's like sometimes when I'm doing a debate, I'm, I'm just getting in it and in it and in it. And I'm getting louder and louder and louder and louder. I'm just like, well, you gotta, you gotta take it down. You don't wanna kill these people. <laughs> Yeah, you can really let it all out because Heidi's giving it her all. I'm giving it my all. I'm trying to destroy Heidi and I'm trying to yell at her during the cross X. I, I would say um, that uh, sometimes it's fun um, debating Heidi because sometimes I try to, you know, trick her with some words. Um, and I will tell a funny story. So we did we did a, a debate call um, and I'm like, okay, Heidi, these are the questions I'm going to ask you for the show. Debate call is like what we do to prepare for the show before oh, the show. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so she's like, okay, I'm preparing my answers for this. I think this is on Off-Broadway, right? Yes. And, um, <laughs> and we're like, yeah, okay. So when the show started, I asked her new questions. <laughs> and she, she was like, uh... <laughs> It was um, really mean. <laughs> but it was fun. It's fun. I like. I personally like things like that because one thing about me, when it comes to like the Constitution, I love when people challenge me. I love thinking on my feet. Like I will. You like. It's just let's keep going. Let's keep going at it. Like I have points. You have points. Some are stronger than others. I will find more points. Invent my own. Um, <laughs> but I, it's just debate. Like it's fun. It's. Amazing. I... <laughs> Rosdelli, actually, when we first started working together, taught me this term called speed thinking, which you learned from your debate coach, Ms. Yeah. Sadie, which I really love, which is this idea of, yeah, being put in kind of the pressure cooker of a debate. Suddenly your mind starts working at this hyperspeed that you and, and ideas start coming to you that you might not have if you were just sitting alone, unchallenged. Um, yeah. And I, I love that idea. I feel like you do that, too. It's just like... Yeah. It's crazy that a 12-year-old two years ago was yelling at you about the Constitution. <laughs> yes, yeah, so Rosalie was 12 when she first started doing the show. So. I was, I was going to ask if there's anything that you and Mike feel like you've learned from working with these two young women. And you kind of just answered that a little bit. I, mean, I learned what a horcrux is in Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big one. Yeah. That's a real big one. No, I've learned a lot. Actually, I also learned from Thursday when we first met, uh, when we first started working together, what strict scrutiny oh, meant. Yeah. I mean, I sort of understood it vaguely as a legal concept, and then she just laid it down for but all of us. It wasn't so. only strict. It's intermediate, rational basis, and strict scrutiny. Yes. <laughs> the levels of scrutiny. <laughs> there are legal terms I had been wrestling with that she explained very cogently uh, upon first meeting. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about the life of the show after the end of August. So the run on Broadway is coming to an end, but what happens next? Well, uh, <laughs> we're going to Washington, D.C. 
in September for two weeks, which will be fascinating. Well, Thursday is going to college. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yay. Which we're all very excited Yay. about. Yes. Um, Rosdelli will be performing in D.C. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're going to do it there for two weeks. And then uh, in 2020, there, there will be a kind of tour. And we're, we're working that out right now because I'm not uh, able to go everywhere. So this will be the first time another actor plays... Um, my role. And we're figuring out how to do that. I think because of the nature of the piece, that person like Mike does in the show will eventually um, have to sort of step out of character and become themselves and share something about themselves in relationship to the Constitution. Um, So we're figuring out how to do that. That's exciting. Yeah, yeah. Do you foresee that you will step into any any of the parts of the tour? I'm sure that I will. Yes. I just I've been doing it for so long now that I just need a little break. But yes, I will definitely do it again in the future. Excellent. Um, So I was kind of wondering um, if, this is for everybody, if there was one amendment or Supreme Court argument that you would like to feature, what would it be? Outside of the two amendments that were discussed in the piece. Oh, like if we want, if we were making a new play. Yeah, absolutely. Oof. I mean, my new play would be called The Equal Rights Amendment. <laughs> Long overdue. Yeah. That's a good title. Yeah. Thank you. ERA. Yeah. Long overdue. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. That would be mine. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to not want to go in on the Second Amendment or Citizens United. I mean, like, the you, both of them are so egregious okay. that I feel like you could talk about both of them for forever and ever i don't know i have no idea how how we would go in on that but i'm i'm, I'm, inter- I'm interested by the problems of both those both those problems well i always thought because i like the creative side of things mm-hmm. so I, w- I always wanted to feature the first amendment and i think the title of my play would be what can i say what can i not Ooh, that's a great title. Mm-hmm. I just thought of it like five <laughs> seconds ago <laughs> what do you think? i'm not going to know I'm next. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know, guys. <laughs> um, I don't know. We, I, I we can, yeah, not right now. <laughs> I'll tell you after. Yeah. Okay. If you could create your own amendment today and you could just put it in the Constitution, what would it be about? Oh, my God. I mean, I'll go back to mine. So I, I think we should pass the ERA, but more importantly, either next or instead of the Equal Rights Amendment, or I, I feel like there is a human rights amendment that needs to be passed. Mm-hmm. And, and this has been discussed. People have talked about this, like an Equal Rights Amendment that, that um, uh, explicitly prohibit, prohibits discrimination, discrimination, excuse me, explicitly prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, gender, sexual orientation, uh, ability, um, immigration status. Uh, just, I, I feel like personally, I think we need a, essentially what I would call a human rights amendment that, um, and Thursday could explain this more uh, cogently to you, but just the idea that it's very hard, for example, to prove discrimination on the basis of sex and the, all those other categories I just listed. So I feel like... Do you guys want yeah. me to explain it to you? Sure. Yes. 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 All right. Yeah. So strict scrutiny, it's still a little bit uh, uh, jumbled in my mind because I did this like three years ago. So it's like the different le- levels of scrutiny. Rational basis is really easy to get passed in court. Cases that go through rational basis, like it's easy for you to get a violation on that. Like the court will just be like, okay, whatever. Like it's like an easy case to pass. Then you have intermediate scrutiny. That's what you bring to the court when you have discrimination based on gender. That's a little easier to pass, but it takes a little bit more time. What you really want is strict scrutiny to be triggered. Once you got strict scrutiny, the court has to take, it's like a deep, and that is strict deep analysis uh, and that's based on race um sex and that is why when it comes to the thing about the equal rights amendment it's like well we have the 14th amendment that says like no just like it basically says equal protection under the law but it's it's up for like it passes like under intermediate scrutiny but not strict scrutiny so when we have the equal rights amendment it has fine lines and so the court has to use strict scrutiny which means wow. that it'll be a lesser chance of them violating your rights ba- uh, rights basis on based on all the things she just listed. And can I ask you, strict scrutiny, okay, so this is what I understand. In okay. terms of like um, 
uh, proving discrimination based on sex, say, based on the fact that I'm a woman, it's like you have to prove intention, right? Is that or? Um, it's yeah. uh, the language. It's uh, it has to be narrowly. The law has to be narrowly tailored. Um, OK, so it's like this. So if alleged like I, the cases that I've got is like um, it's like if the if your legislature uh, passed a law that says like, um, well, because you're I don't know, a woman, you can't do this. You can bring that uh, uh, case to the Supreme Court. And then it's like, is this law um, oh, narrowly tailored? I forgot. The, there's another one. There's two. There's two. Two. Um, uh, steps that you have to pass like it's like it's fine 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 lines like it's like it has to serve like the means but the general idea is that it's just harder to prove discrimination on the basis yeah. of sex and, and, and it's uh, yeah. like it, it goes um like you have a less violation like right it's so when i learned it i was like what <laughs> this is what I, we I do in rehearsal all the time um, but we so, need the equal rights amendment that's all i'm saying and it should cover a lot of categories <laughs> i'll give an example i've done this really i've been done with debates so i like erased my everything um but it's like i forgot the word it's like it has to be narrowly tailored to and something else yeah it's something else right. there's two things it's like it's the two, law two sort of litmus test yeah Mm, there right? you go. You're in my mind. Yeah, I forgot the the second <laughs> part. Um, but it's like you bring you bring you bring it to the court. I will just say this. I'm, I'm in the piggyback. No, me. no. She explained it to me very well, like the legal implications. And then what? Because I'm an actor and not. I like took it into the larger story, which is just like the the numerous ways the Fourteenth Amendment you know, equal protection of the law, uh, has failed so many populations in this country. Even though it nominally so is many to of us, all these even though it's supposed to protect all of us equally, it just is failing us over and over again. And therefore I think we need an amendment that, that explicitly states who is protected and why and how that's what I think. Okay. But also no. I, I just have to say one thing. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I, um, <laughs> I've been thinking about this for a while. So I brought the Equal Rights Amendment to school, right? I, um, I was, you know, given a presentation. And then one of my friends asked me, um, society has evolved and new, like, identities are being created. And it's like, will the Equal Rights Amendment be for them, too? It's a, a great gender, question. New, new sort of gender because categories. Because we know it's for women. Yes. Yeah. Right. But then it's like, but then who knows what we're going to have yeah. 30, 50 years from now. Yeah. Are we going to just make another amendment for them? Well, yeah. why don't we make a, a, a more a, a encompassing amendment then, you know? I think if you say on the basis of gender, for example, then that would, if you identify as non-binary. Then that trans, would be intermediate. Yeah. It's so, it's. Because. Like Thursday said, in 30 years, we don't know what group we might be oppressing well, right now. I'm so you're saying, like, if we enumerate the categories, then we might be in trouble in 30 years. I mean, yeah, because there might be something that comes up right. that we don't know about yet. Well, then we pass another amendment. Yeah. All right. It's not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's just pass an amendment. Um, so let's take a couple questions from the audience. We'll, we'll go over here first. Okay. Uh, thanks for this. This was great. Um, so I was struck when you had the experience of Sonia Sotomayor telling you that Ruth Bader Ginsburg wasn't coming, that <laughs> uniquely not too many people have been deliberately lied to by <laughs> 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 I'm wondering what that effect has on your faith in sort of the constitution. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> uh, um <laughs> uh, uh, it doesn't have have an a, a, an effect. I, I'm really actually happy she did that, um, <laughs> because for Justice with Mayor, it was like ah, like I screamed. But then for RBG, it was like a whole different like. Bye. It was like it was like 
She wouldn't have been able to do the debate if right. she Right. I would have probably, like, just froze and was like, show over, the end. Like, you know, like, <laughs> I would have probably, like, walked off stage. So I'm kind of happy um, that she did that. And it turns out that they've been having conversations about me. They've been in cahoots with each other. <laughs> so maybe that's not a bad thing. I actually love my constitution even more because, you know what, these women get to stay on that court along yeah. with other people. But... <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming out today. Um, so my question is, you mentioned that, you know, every day sometimes your feelings towards the show change based on the news. And as an audience member, when I saw it, I can definitely see, had I saw the show maybe two weeks earlier, how I would feel the same. So I'm curious, as you get ready to go on tour, what role of location do you think is maybe oh, going to take into a good question. the audience? <sighs> that's a fantastic question. I, uh, I don't know. I'm so excited to find out. I mean, I'm so I would love to take it to my hometown, for example, which is um, uh, somewhat it's an amazing town. It's a rural, fairly conservative town. I I, um, I I I crafted it deliberately to to be a conversation, to be something that would hopefully be well welcoming to different kinds of people, in part because I would like to bring it to my town. So I, I, I don't know. I think it will be interesting to, to do it for people who are maybe less on the same page than, than we all, we are all, you know, we are all on the same page about most of these issues. And I think it will be uh, important and fascinating to take it to places where people maybe are not. Um, yeah. I'm, but I have no idea what that's going to look like. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for coming. I've been following this since it was off Broadway, the New York Theater Workshop, and it's just, it's amazing, but it's great that you guys are getting such positive reception, too, because everyone loves it. It's a really important play. Um, I wanted to know sort of your decision. You talked a little bit about the decision to cast teenagers as sort of a play on your teenage self, but I'm interested to know your decision to cast non-professional actors and debaters, and also why specifically you chose these two great ladies. Uh... I wanted, to, I mean, I wanted to have real debaters because I wanted to have a real debate and I didn't want to cast an actor and then write a debate for us that was then performed. Now, of course, we've been doing it a long time, so there is a performing element to it now and we know the debate quite well. Um, but I wanted the reality of like, of getting into it with an actual debater. Uh, and then the truth is, as you might know, like uh, debate and theater, there's a lot of crossover, especially in high school, like a lot of kids who do both. Roselli does Thursday. No, you haven't done theater before this, right? Um, but that was the reason. And then in terms of Thursday and Roselli, I, uh, I will just say this. The, we've had two rounds of auditions when we first hired um, Rose Deli when she was 12 in our first workshop version of it. And then Thursday we hired uh, for New York Theater Workshop. I, you know, we had several days of auditions in both cases. Those were the best days of my life. I was like, wow, every young woman in the city is a genius, apparently. <laughs> uh, it was really overwhelming, truly, and gave me such hope. Um, and out of all of those geniuses, these were the most brilliant. So that's all I can say. They truly just blew me away with their um, their intellect and their talent. Even though Heidi wasn't at my audition. I saw your video. <laughs> video? Yes. What you video? Were, you, oh my God. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Great choices. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm visiting from London this week and coincidentally was at your show last night, which oh was my gosh. amazing. Yeah. Thank um, you. I learned a ton about the U.S. Constitution that I didn't know. And it made me wonder if you thought about what you wanted foreigners, non-Americans to take from from the play. Wow. I uh, oh. So I... I don't know what I intended, but I will say a lot of people, uh, we have a lot of judges actually from other countries. When yeah, we have the debate at the end, yeah. 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 A lot of times judges... I think when they're not from America, a lot of times they vote to abolish. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. They're like, yeah, get rid of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm from Canada. Use ours. Or, uh, <laughs> but I, what I have noticed, like speaking to people from other countries, and you all don't have a constitution, right? No. Um, is that I, I think the uh, questions we're asking and the issues we're debating are, are issues that are 
uh, urgent in pretty much every country in the world right now. And that's the feedback I've been getting in terms of like whose rights are protected, whose aren't, um, uh, what immigration means to any given country, what uh, the, the rights of women are in a, any given country. So I've found that there's a lot of, seems to be a lot of universal connection, which has been exciting. And then, and then either countries also, they have a constitution or they don't, but they're really interested in the idea of like how a document like this um, shapes uh, a country and shapes a people. Um, hey, all I just saw your show on Monday. It was amazing. Thank you for coming and talking to us. Um, something that really struck me while I was watching it is that you all clearly seem to like hold some sort of love for the Constitution. I would guess largely like the government and some of its workings. And I think that's something that affects so many Americans today is just this belief that like the Constitution is so broken that it's really not something for us. Um, and fixing it feels so insurmountable. So how do you balance like despair at current state of things with like really caring for this document and thinking that it could work for us. I feel like one of the things that the show does almost addresses the previous point too. One of the things is that it's just that we get, it's a chance to get up close with something that in a way we're expected to take for granted. Do you know what I mean? We don't, it's just engage. I think that the end point of the show could be actual engagement with something that dictates our lives that we spend, you know, a significant amount of time trying not to think about. I mean, not to make a Google centric metaphor, but like, it's like a terms and conditions kind of a thing. You know what I mean? Like you check off the box of terms and conditions and you don't actually read it. Do you know what I'm saying? And yeah. like, and so like, it, I feel like the, the constitution is that we're, we're just, we're taking the time. I mean, my friends who see it, it's always, they're, they're, I feel like they don't ever say it, but they're quite shocked with how deep Heidi goes into one amendment. Yeah. It's just like, even when you learn it in school, you don't do, you don't do that. You don't actually go sort of word by word and be like, this relates to me like this, this relates to me. So, I mean, I think it's just, there's a way that no matter how many horrible things have been done in the name of this document, engagement with it, I think promotes hope, weirdly. Like... It seems insurmountable because it seems like you're, ne you're never going to be able to read this whole thing. But actually, all you have to do is start reading it at some point, and then you can assimilate it. I don't know. Now I'm just using words. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Makes sense. <laughs> uh, we'll take one more question, I think. Um, do you ever hear Supreme Court rulings that you agree with the outcome but disagree with the interpretation of the Constitution, or vice versa, where you... Mm. Uh, agree with the interpretation, but don't like the outcome. And like, is that a good thing, or should the? What does it mean for the Constitution? Should the goal be to fix the Constitution and interpret it faithfully, or use the tools we have to sort of get the outcome, whatever way possible? That's a great question. I think there's. Wait, has, I'm yeah. sorry. Can you just give me that question again? <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's what should the goal of the Constitution be? Oh wait. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. So the first one you said, have you ever had an interpretation where you're like, you don't agree with? Well, you um, either agree with the interpretation and don't like the outcome or disagree with the interpretation, but you're like, good, yes. I wanted this. So in DC versus Heller, our Supreme Court um, stated that uh, handguns are considered uh, protected under arms. But then there was, an inter there was a reasoning that says it's um, anything that's not dangerous and unusual. So when I debated this, I'm like, all guns are dangerous and unusual. <laughs> and unusual. <laughs> what type of interpretation are we... But I agreed with it. I said, okay, fine. It's, you know, fine, fine. So that's my example. Yeah. And uh, then... Oh. Yeah, go. No. And your second question was, how do we... Well, so if you, if you agree with the interpretation of DC versus Heller, like, is that... Um, is that a failing of the Constitution, right. or mm -hmm. would it have been a good thing if the if the minority opinion, which you disagree with, had won? If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah right, right, right. I mean, many of the cases that that are cited had multiple arguments, right? Like, especially I mean, if it's like a seven to two court, there'll be like two or three factions. Isn't that true? Like, and I mean, that's a good question. I mean, does it? I don't. I don't know. 
if you have to agree with how they arrive at a certain decision, they just have to abide by the decision. I, I suppose the, the Supreme Court would say you just have to abide by the decision no matter how they got there, but... I, I would say this, like, I, it's a fantastic question. And I think the one thing, the one thing I've honed in on just making the play and performing it over and over is that when, when it seems clear that the Constitution is consistently failing a group of people, then I feel like maybe we, this is the point that we look and say we need to pass an amendment. For example, in, in the cases I talk about, Griswold versus Connecticut, Roe v. Wade, those are decisions I agree with. Griswold legalized uh, birth control. Roe v. Wade legalized um, uh, the right to choice, the right to get an abortion. I, um, I agree with both those, those decisions, but not the way they came about them. You know, they Right. You, you know, they tried to bring both of those cases in terms of equal protection under the law, which means like, how can you be equally protected in this country as a woman if you don't have rights over your own body, if you don't, if you're not allowed to control your own reproductive life? Um, but that was not, it's not how the are. court didn't think that worked. So they had to bring it under the right to privacy, which is a very tenuous right. It's not enumerated in the Constitution. Yeah. It's not. A, a, and, and it's one of the things that has left our reproductive rights uh, in peril. So I think those were good decisions made with bad reasoning. Personally, a lot of people disagree with me. Um, and then I think the other case I talk about in the play, which is uh, Gonzalez versus Castle Rock, which is where the Constitution, the, it, it just explicitly failed to say that women have protection in this country from domestic violence, from physical violence, from sexual violence. It said that there is no, that the police are not compelled by the constitution to offer that kind of protection. Yeah. Um, it was a badly argued case in many ways. There were problems with it. But to me, the fact that, that there was no way that it was so hard to find in favor of police protection for in this case, a woman and her daughters, uh, suggests to me that there's something wrong with the Constitution and that we should look again at passing an amendment. So, and I think that the Constitution was, I mean, it was explicitly um, written to evolve. Like, so I don't think when people talk about being originalist, to me, the originalist spirit of the Constitution is that it was made explicitly to be something that grows and changes. They did it right away. They put the Bill of Rights in right away. So I feel like, um, to me, yeah, uh, to me, originalism is this is an evolving Constitution. Yeah. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. I would I'd love to continue this conversation, <laughs> and I love talking to all of you, and I know we're all having a great time, but we are at time. So I want to thank you so much, each of you, for coming in today and wish you the best on the rest of the run and the show's future. So thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Thank you.